I think the key thing to understand is that the nutrients in plant foods, first of all, they're less nutrient dense, and the nutrients within them, by and large, are much poorer qualities. They're less absorbable and they're less bioavailable. So this includes things like even omega-3. So if we have a look at the ALA, which is a precursor to the active forms of omega-3 in the body, less than 5% is actually converted into the biologic reactive forms. The plant source of vitamin A, for instance, is probably about 12 times less biologically active mm -hmm. than the animal form. So we see the forms of iron, so heme iron versus non-heme iron, it makes a massive difference. And even then, even if we are consuming nutrients, there's other factors in plant foods called anti-nutrients which can actually block their absorption. I'd like to show you this paper. So this paper was done quite some time ago. And it was published in uh, 1979. And if you have a look at this graph here, this shows how much zinc is actually being absorbed into the body after consuming 120 grams of oysters. You can see that we get quite a good amount of zinc that actually gets absorbed and ends up in the circulation. Now what happens if you combine that same amount of oysters with 120 grams of corn or tortillas. We can see here the bottom line. Mm -hmm. The absorption of zinc is basically stopped. So this is called an anti nutrient effect. You have this much zinc, which is we go call the area under the curve, which will give you how much is actually entered into the circulation, versus basically zero. And this is an a these anti-nutrient effects are real. So if you're looking at a label, and let's say you had a packet of corn tortillas and they had added zinc to it, do you really think that added zinc is going to be beneficial if your body can't absorb it? And we know that plant foods, say tea for instance, can impact your body's ability to absorb iron. The, uh, the nutrient quality of plant foods is far far less. So if we look at it in its entirety, number one, that animal foods can, play, can contain all the nutrients that you need, that phytochemicals, plant chemicals actually don't serve a part of human physiology and they're very poorly absorbed anyway, and the anti-nutrients in plant foods can then block absorption of healthy nutrients anyway, you can see you've really got a triple whammy. So when it comes to nutrition status, it's absolutely true that animal foods are best. And don't think that this doesn't have very real consequences on people. So if we take the most common nutrient that everybody always talks about in terms of vegetarian diets, it's B12, because we know that animal foods really don't contain any B12. But every vegetarian, almost, I'm sure, knows this. So they must be supplementing with it. So if there was a nutrient of concern that shouldn't be an issue in vegetarians, it should be B12 because they should all know to supplement with it. And then also from the EPIC Oxford study, we have this kind of paper, which shows that we have a massive rate of B12 deficiency. So this study found that 52% of vegans were deficient in B12, despite, I'm sure, almost all of them knowing that it was something that they needed to supplement with. And don't for a second think that this doesn't have real issues. This is a systematic review that when we look at the more modern assays of B12, we find that if you're low in B12, it affects your intelligence. It affects your cognition, how your brain functions, increases the risk of dementia. This is very, very real. We know that iron deficiency is very common because the, the non-heme iron we have in vegetarian foods is really not very well absorbed. So this study actually looked at females who had iron deficiency and then looked at what happened to their, basically their intelligence if they were able to correct that iron deficiency. So if we have a look here, you can see here that in terms of their learning, their memory and their attention, these grade bars here were in those females who they improved their iron levels on in their blood. You can see they literally 
increased their intelligence by replacing iron. We take another supplement called creatine. In meat, this is naturally present. In flesh, this is naturally present. But it's not naturally present in plant foods. And we've got randomised control trial level of evidence that supplementing vegetarians and vegans with creatine improves intelligence. This is the best level of medical evidence we have. We can't pretend that the nutrient deficiencies within vegan and vegetarian diets aren't having a real impact on people. We know that in young children, vegetarian children, they are deficient in these nutrients and this affects them for their whole lifespan. It affects their intelligence, it affects their growth. We've already talked about how we can reduce underweight children by 74% simply by supplementing with one egg a day. That's a massive improvement. If we're trying to have healthy, robust children that are growing, their brains are developing, they absolutely need animal nutrition. It's just madness to think that any other diet is going to be optimal. The reason a lot of people are concerned about animal foods is because they're rich in saturated fat. But they don't just contain saturated fat. And as I've already explained, saturated fat is not deleterious in any way. It's actually very, very healthy. But the interesting thing is when we come to the polyunsaturated fats, the omega-3s and the omega-6s, because their chemical structure means they're very prone to something called oxidation stress. Um, it means they contain double bonds which are reactive. And if these fats oxidise before we consume them, they actually generate oxidative stress in the liver and can contribute to problems like insulin resistance. So, and we've actually measured this when we do studies and we give people vegetable oils, which we know are heavily oxidised, we can actually measure these oxidised components in their blood very shortly after consumption. The beautiful thing about animal foods is, though, that we wouldn't eat them if they were off, if they were rancid. So the definition of rancidity is basically when the fats oxidise. So if we're, these monounsaturated and polyunsaturated oils, so uh, called oleic acid and omega-3 and omega-6, they are essential to good health. But if we get them from meat sources, we're getting them so they're not oxidised, assuming that they're fresh, and they actually are essential, they're actually healthy for us. Whereas if we get those same oils and same fats from, say, a vegetable oil, the chances are, because these things oxidise within a matter of days, chances are that they are heavily oxidised and they'll be doing us damage. And that likely explains while the Sydney Diet Heart Study, the Minnesota Coronary Experiment, the corn oil study, all these studies actually demonstrated harms of vegetable oil consumption. So yes, meat is very rich in fat, but that's a good thing. It, it provides us with all the fats we need, saturated, monounsaturated, and polyunsaturated, and the best thing is in fresh meat, those fats are not oxidised, they're not doing us any harm at all. So I see a lot of patients who are concerned about their LDL levels because they've gone on a ketogenic or a carnivore-style diet and their LDL levels have increased. And invariably, they've been told by their other doctors that it's going to be causing them harm, that it's going to increase their chance of an early death. But when we actually look at the evidence, this isn't actually borne out. This was published in 2016. It's a systematic review of 19 studies, prospective studies, that looked at mortality and LDL levels. And of those 19 studies, 16 of them, representing 92% of total participants, found an inverse relationship. Basically, this found that the higher your LDL level was, the more likely it was for you to live longer. And this absolutely flies in the face. But this is a very good paper. This is a systematic review of prospective studies published in a top journal. So in terms of am I concerned about my patient's LDL levels if they go high, not in and of itself. We always have a look at the other metabolic risk factors. We have a look at other parameters that will actually give us far more indication of their real cardiovascular risk 
LDL, for all intents and purposes, does not serve that purpose.